I was only introduced to the idea of straw bale houses for my brother. He built one in the, in the Laurentian. I went out to help him build for about five weeks. And so he got me thinking about it. I'm Sheldon Dumont. This is my straw bale house on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. I obviously couldn't build the same way my brother did, which was post and beam with clay on the outside. Um, it wasn't going to work here. This is a terrible place to build a straw bale house. We're on the top of a hill. Uh, the North Atlantic is 100 meters that way. We get nor'easters from that way. We get hurricanes from that way. We get wind out of the Labrador from that way. So uh, I had to come up with a different idea. I started looking what other people had done, and uh, there's not a lot of straw bale houses built in this sort of situation. So, I mean, if you look at the books like Sirius Straw Bale and a few others like that, a lot of them are built in Arizona, Nevada, that kind of thing. But I did see some built in New England, but again in sheltered locations. From research, I decided straw is no different than the cellulose. But one of the advantages of straw bale is since the walls are so thick, you don't get a dew point, like the warm, moist air doesn't go in and then condense like it would in a 2x4 or 2x6 wall. The temperature gradation is so slow that it will leave as a vapor. I designed it all around that idea. I'm going to build very traditional on the outside. I'm going to build rain screen so the wind-driven rain isn't a problem, um, which is a big issue around here, obviously. 1x6 cedar siding, tongue and groove, and then plywood and Tyvek and then the straw. It's sort of two houses stuck together. I guess I wanted to try two different building methods. I came up with this idea of how to do these double thick walls and then tried it out on the, on the guest house down there, as we call it, it's, it's the bunkie out back. And it worked, it worked great. Um, made some slight modifications to it. Double 2x6 stud skinned with plywood and then you just slide the bales between it. Chainsaw the bales smooth on either side, slide them in, sit on them, pack them down and they just stack right up. It's a really fast way to, to bale up a wall. In fact, if I was to do it all again, I probably would have done both sides of the house that way because it was so easy. The other side is the 2x6 and there was a lot of notching of bales. I mean, it worked really well. The bales sit in there really tight, but it was time consuming using the, the chainsaw and trimming everything and sticking it in. And uh, this worked so smooth, I would have just done it this way. Because we get the winds here, you can put them to use. There's very good open ventilation on the top of the roof here. Air comes through, goes along the top of the roof and out the other side, and that keeps lots of airflow up above. It's important always to make sure that any air that enters the wall can leave and it doesn't get trapped up against poly that's in the ceiling. The joists go this way and then on top of it is two by fours which are open to the air so air can come up, move down the two by fours and then out the other side. I would say the walls have been sealed up and in their finished state for about six years. Drilling into the outside of the house to put in a vent or something like that, I've been able to keep track of what's happening inside the walls every couple of years. And the straw was in the same condition as when I put it into the wall. An exposed bale actually is a bit of a fire hazard because of the, uh, you know, the loose straw on the outside. So it's best to get it covered right away. We bought a mortar mixer from uh, Grand Manan Island. Drove all the way to, over to Grand Manan Island to get them. There's not very many of them around, so you have to hunt around for them. And this thing was just churning out the cob, which is chopped straw mixed with the clay, which was sand. And then a hamburger at a time, just, you know, start at the bottom and work your way up. It's a long, time-consuming process. We had three levels of scaffolding up here, wheeling it around, carting up buckets of cob up the, up the ladders. Just turn on the music <laughs> and mud away. The 
This is the only wall in the house that doesn't have any lime on it. You actually can see the chopped straw. And you can also feel how it turns to basically concrete. The, uh, the clay and the sand and the chopped straw is extremely hard. The one place I didn't use straw at all on the wall is just in this corner right here because it's right above the bathtub. And I wanted to make sure that no evaporating water out of the bathtub was going to get into the walls and cause any problems in these bales. So what I did, this is just R45 double layer of pink insulation. Bales come up to a stud here and then I stop it, do this in, in pink insulation and then restart bales on the other side. So this is all just traditional stick frame in there. We can be 30 degrees outside, but it never gets that hot in here because all of the heat can just go into the mass of the walls. For the energy efficiency or the, I mean, the look and the, uh, how well it works for insulation and how well it works for heat storage, I would absolutely build this way again, absolutely. We get a fair amount of, of sunshine in the winter time. It coincides actually with the coldest temperatures is when you get most of the sun because the wind's blowing from the north. Clear skies, but extremely cold. So actually, passive solar works really good here. So went with big windows to the south and almost no windows on the north side so we could maximize how much we catch heat. One of the big advantages of straw bale, of course, is that it gives you somewhere to hang mass. What you want to do with a, with a passive straw barrel house is bring in lots of light and then have walls that aren't white. And so if they're mid-tone, it'll absorb the energy. The white ceiling bounces the uh, radiation back down into the room and so then it's picked up by the tile and then underneath this tile is an inch and a half of concrete and all the walls are an inch and a half of uh, clay and sand and so they weigh a lot. There's a lot of mass everywhere it can go. All, all the uh, heat go into the walls so as the sun comes in warms up the room it goes into the walls and then it absorbs all day and releases all night. It's a fairly big house but we only burn maybe two cords of wood uh, a year. Most of our heat really comes from the sun. Even when it's five below or ten below outside if it's sunny we don't have to burn. It's very energy efficient. We don't really even think about heating costs. Most houses are based around the idea of what you do is you heat up the air and then you try to keep the air in. So it's like a balloon and then you have to have HVACs, which we have, we have an HVAC of course, it's required by code, um, to, to exchange the air. So really all you're thinking about in a traditional house is heating the air and then trying to recirculate it and draw as much heat out of it before you let it all leave. It's an extremely inefficient way to heat when you think about it because all you're doing is heating up something that, can, that wants to leave and can leave through every single gap and crack in your house. But if you're not depending on heated air, um, it becomes less of an issue. You almost don't need the HVAC. You just open up the doors, let some fresh air in and close them back up again and then the heat comes back out of your walls. We leave the door open, let the dogs run around, come back in again. As soon as you close the door, heat comes out of the walls and reheats the house. So you're not heating your house through warm air, you're heating it through warm walls and a warm floor. The masonry stove was actually designed in from almost the very first sketches because in conjunction with trying to figure out how to build a really energy efficient warm house, masonry stoves kept on coming up and they're uh, Scandinavian Russian design which seemed similar to our climate in many ways, particularly Norway. If they're using them, it's probably going to work here. In fact, the very first thing I actually did on the house after the foundation was poured was build the foundation for the masonry stove, which is all made out of solid cinder block. And the masonry stoves are extremely heavy, and so you need to continue the mass support all the way down to the, the footing. So even the footing had to be poured right from the very start for that stove. But they're very expensive. So we built it with the idea that once we'd got to a point where we could now buy the masonry stove, then that it would come later. So we used just a wood stove, which actually worked quite well uh, for a few years. And then we came across a good price on a, uh, on a masonry, so we were able to put it in then. I'm a geophysical technologist, digital cartographer, graphic designer, and I'm not a builder. The only thing I'd built before this house was a wood surfboard, which is hanging over there in the wall. And I'd helped my brother build his straw bale house, well, just the post and beam part. My first experience of actually constructing something that you could live in was the little bunkie out back. I just learned from books both on traditional stick frame building, some straw bale books, 
Lots of downloadable PDFs. When you're building straw bale, you have to make some stuff up as you go a little bit. And just, I trust physics more than chemistry. I'm not using a lot of caulking and silicone and all that kind of stuff to keep water out of the walls. I don't think it works over time. You can see with freeze thaw cycles, it just cracks and no water gets in anyway. I always build with the idea if water comes in, I'm just gonna give it somewhere to go. And that's sort of the whole basis of rain screen anyway. So really close attention to details, always thinking about where air goes and where water goes. And thinking of, of air as this fluid thing that moves through the house. And especially when you have a single central source of heat, you have to think about, okay, how's the heat gonna get over to this part of the house? How's the heat gonna move over here? For instance, in the bathroom, there's, a, uh, there's an open space above the door. The idea being that um, there's no heat source up there. So when you turn on the bathroom fan, what you're doing is sucking warm air out of the room. You're creating a low pressure, so air has got to come in to replace it. I wanted the replacement air to come in off the ceiling, warm air coming in off the ceiling, not cold air through a gap underneath the door, because then you'd have a cold floor. So just thinking about you know air moving through the house as, as a liquid and water, if it comes in, make sure it can leave. I'd drawn up the plans myself with the double height living room. I was told that I had no choice but to get an engineer to stamp the drawings. And that seemed more of an issue than the straw bale ever was. The dealing with the city was surprisingly easy. You're, you're assigned an inspector and she didn't seem to have any problem with it. I showed her some books that I'd used for reference and one of them's written by an engineer, which obviously they like to see some numbers. At least she's mostly concerned with the, the structural components. I mean, making sure that all my posts have continuation of force right through to the, the foundation. From their perspective in, in this house, the straw is really just insulation. It really doesn't have any impact on the structural integrity, except it makes it heavier. And if you've already taken that into account in the engineering, then it's fine. If you were to do this house with double stud walls, which is the only way you could get R45 in a wall like this, would be a double stud wall, rock sill maybe, um, and then be really careful with your vapor barriers and everything like that. You could achieve R45 walls, but it would cost you a fortune. Mm -hmm.